reiterate what a joy it has been to serve with you all, with Pastor Billy and Frankie and the whole crew, uh, here with Pastor Charles and the crew from Restore Church. Thank you, sister, for leading us a wonderful time of worship, and thank you for that word of testimony. What a privilege it is to worship. And uh, we didn't finish our worship, we're just going to continue worshiping, right? Worship with the washing of the water of the word. For Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When I ask you this question as we begin, how important is faith to the Christian life? On a scale of 0 to 10, how important is faith? Yeah, I know, right. Infinity, right, is everything. For instance, you don't, you don't even get saved except but by faith, right? It says in Ephesians, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Jesus said in John 8, 24, unless you believe, there's the faith word, I am, you will die in your sins. And that wonderful sequence in Romans 10, how shall they call upon him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear unless somebody be sent? And then that thing about how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good tidings of good news, which means I don't care if you have bunions and ingrown toenails, if you're carrying the gospel, you've got beautiful feet. And then it's this, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So yeah, man, faith is super important. And faith is super important for sanctification, right? Paul will talk about the obedience of faith. In other words, the obedience that is fueled by faith. In Romans 6, he says you need to know certain things and reckon them as so that the old man was buried with Christ. That is believing terminology. So we could not possibly overestimate the significance of faith in the Christian life. Amen? Amen. Hebrews says, without faith, it is impossible to, ble to please God. For he that comes to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So faith is super important. One of the big names in the new atheism movement recently Tweet it, Christianity, the belief that one God created the universe 13.79 billion years ago, 92 billion light years in diameter, consisting of 200 billion galaxies, each having 200 billion stars, and he did it because he wants to have a relationship with you. They were trying to mock the idea of Christians. And I would quibble with the numbers of how long the earth was created, but I'd say, yeah, baby, that's it. God did create the universe, ultimately for his glory, to have a relationship with us. It does sound crazy to people, though, right? Yeah. And that's why the Bible wants us to make sure that we have rich faith, robust faith, growing faith. Because, you know, the Bible does talk about uh, fake faith, James 2.17. Yeah. It talks about demonic faith, James 2.19. You believe that there's one God, woohoo. The demons believe and they also tremble. There is temporary faith, the parable of the four soils, Matthew 13. And, and, and let's be honest, your faith is under siege, right? Yeah. We who have real faith even, not this fake stuff, not this demonic stuff, not this temporary stuff, we know what it is to have our faith waver, right? Yes. It is a, a, attacked objectively is what I believe really true. And it is attacked subjectively, do I really believe what I say I believe? Who here has read uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress? That's an awesome book. And that book is the kind of the allegory of a man named Christian's journey to Christ and then journey in his faith in Christ to home, Celestial City. And when he sets off, his wife says, you're crazy. And then he comes across Mr. Worldly Wiseman. Then he falls in the slew of despond, depression. You ever been there? And then he, is, he's, uh, he goes to Vanity Fair. Remember that city? Yes. Houston, Detroit, <laughs> all the rest. <laughs> and they mock him. And he's thrown in jail. Where he is, he's just lingering right there. And, and he's tormented by a giant despair. And then he finds the key of promise. And it's unlocked by what? By faith. 
And he's set free. But even then, his journey of faith is not over. He is uh, attacked, as it were, by Mr. Atheist, by Mr. Flatterer. And in his last run, before he goes to glory, he crosses this river and it nearly drowns him. Sometimes you'll have your biggest faith battles towards the end of your life. Now that is, an, that is a great illustration in this book of how in our life, our faith is often tried and is often tested. I think every Christian here who's been with Christ for any amount of time can say, yeah, I, I identify with that. We would have to admit that the 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 thing is hard. That it is often very hard to walk by faith and not by sight. It was true for the disciples, and it's true for us today. Now, this beautiful story that Arpith just read, Jesus takes this poignant, painful story to show us, the disciples then and us today, what the kind of faith he wants us to have is supposed to look like. So the key verse is verse 20. Because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here, and it will move. So I want to preach to you this morning on this topic. Mustard seed, mountain moving faith, or the faith that God expects all of his kids to have, all of us who follow Christ to have. You all with me? This is a little bit more context, okay? He's not talking about moving a literal mountain right here. There's some quack in Korea a few years ago. He said, by faith, he moved the mountain four feet, okay? No, um, the mustard seed is also not quite literal, right? It, the, the Bible uses illustrations and metaphors. The apostles never moved the mountain. Jesus never moved the mountain. He could if he wanted to, but we don't have a record of him doing that. No, no, no. What the mountain stands for is an overwhelming, insurmountable problem that you can't handle in your own strength. And I got receipts on that. You go to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 4. You go to Isaiah chapter 49, verse 11. Isaiah 54, 10. That shows you that it's, he's drawing back into Old Testament imagery, saying here's a mountain, something that's really tough in your life that you can't handle in your own strength. I bet you got some mountains. Now the mountain in this story is a man. He has a son. His son is seized by epileptic, epileptic uh, seizures, Right? He's also demon-possessed. Now, we don't know whether the demon caused the epileptic seizures or whether he leveraged them, but in any case, he was trying to use them to destroy this man's son. If we went to the Gospel of Mark, we would discover that this son had had this demon possession, this epilepsy, since he was a child. So, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? We also are told in Matthew that he would, that throws him down a lot in the fire or in the water. Now think about that, this. In that day, the only source of cooking heat was fire. The only source of heating your home was fire. So in other words, this was a constant risk for the guy. Like every day, throwing himself down in the fire or in the water where he would drown. Mark tells us that when that would happen, he would become rigid as a board. He would grind his teeth. He would foam at the mouth. Can you just imagine the misery of this, this man, this demon-possessed man? Can you imagine the misery of his father? Day after day, emotionally, physically, trying to shepherd his son and keep him alive. Well, having laid out the context, I just want us to very plainly see three aspects of mustard seed mountain moving faith or the faith that God expects all his kids to have first of all what I want us to see is that kind of faith perseveres say that with me it perseveres in other words it doesn't turn away when the mountain in your life is not yet moved because you ask God once and it's still there therefore I'm not going to press on now, we're going to see this, first of all, negatively illustrated in the life of nine disciples. If you went back to an earlier part of Matthew 17, Jesus previously is up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he brings Peter and James and John, leaving the other nine left behind. And what we're going to see is those nine did not persevere in their faith in this instance. 
when they come off the mountain, again, Jesus, Peter, James, and John, they discovered that the disciples were not able to heal that demon-possessed man. Look at verse 17. I'm sorry, verse 16. The man says of his son, I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered these words now, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? There's, there's some holy exasperation going on there, isn't there? But what I want you to know, to really understand what's going on, is this. Those words, that expression, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, doesn't come out of a vacuum. Rather, Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy 32. And the early Jewish listener or reader they would, have, they would have made a connection, a parallel, if you will, between two events. Here they are. Back in Deuteronomy, Moses goes up on the mountain, the Mount Sinai. Do you remember that? And he is getting the law from God. Do you remember when he comes off the mountain, what do they have to do with his face? Because he's glowing, right? Because he's been in the very presence of God. So you have Moses... Up on a mountain, Deuteronomy, he comes off the mountain, his face glowing. You go to the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17. Jesus is likewise up on a mountain, hey? And his face is what? And not because he's in the presence of God, but because he is the presence of God. Jesus is God. But the analogy is they're both up on a mountain and they are glowing. Now, Deuteronomy 18, again, Moses, when he comes off the mountain... He finds that the people of Israel are in a hot mess. Do you remember that? I don't know what they they wild out. They thought, where's, where's our guy at? He's up there too long. And so they, maybe they thought the other nations, they, they worship these idols. So Aaron collects all the gold and he makes a golden calf. And they're worshiping it. And, and by the way, it's so funny how Moses, or Aaron describes that when Moses comes down. He says, what happened? He says, I don't know. I just threw some gold in the fire and now came a golden calf. <laughs> don't we justify our sin like that sometimes too? Yeah. Yeah. But he calls, calls them a twisted and faithless generation. So again, glory up on the mountain. Moses comes down, hot mess. Now listen. Jesus likewise comes off the mountain. Matthew 17, first part. Down, down off the mountain, Matthew 17, second part, and he likewise discovers nothing less than a hot mess. If you were to go to the Gospel of Mark, you would find that there's an argument between the nine disciples who were unable to cast out the man's demon-possessed uh, son, say, rescue him. He's, they're arguing with the scribes. Probably the scribes are saying, yeah, you guys are a bunch of punks. You can't even do what you say Jesus can. So they come down, they discover a hot mess, and here's the thing. The disciples had already been given power to cast out demons. Do you, you realize that? If you went to Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 12, the disciples were empowered to cast out demons. They were instructed how to do it, and they were given authority to do so. In fact, we know they did it because in Matthew, uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 17, they're like, hey, even the demons are subject to us in your name. You remember that? But apparently, they weren't able, though they had done it before, to cast out this demon from this man's son. And apparently, they didn't even press on to try. They didn't go to Jesus and say, hey, we're having a hard time in this particular instance. Can you help us? No. They basically said to the, to the dad, sorry, pops, you're out of luck. We can't do anything. And Jesus then, using what happened in Deuteronomy 18, describes... He describes them with those same words. He says to those nine, he says to the scribes, he says to the world, you faithless and twisted generation. That's Christ's perspective of what was going on. Now there's an added layer here. What we also learn from this analogy going on, this parallel, is that one way to describe, the one way to describe when we ask God to move a mountain and he doesn't move it right away and we go in another direction, the Bible actually would call that idolatry. Now think about it. You're facing God because you want to worship him and he is the source of life. He's the only one who can forgive. He's the only one who can get you through. And you're, you have this mountain in your life, right? And you say, Lord, please, please take care of it, whatever it is. 
and he doesn't do it right away. And what do we often do? We look for something else to, to deal with the pain, right? We look for someone else to deal with the pain, right? In other words, there's no neutral. If you're, you're either facing God or you're facing something else. There's no, like, non-God space. Facing God or you're facing somewhere else. And wherever you're facing somewhere else, that in, in becomes your de facto God. Whatever you're facing, that's your God. I don't know if that's making sense. But for the disciples, it was self-reliance, apparently. Hey, we should ask ourselves this question. Listen. When my mountain is not moved in my timing, to where do I turn? Do I turn to busyness? Do I turn to another relationship? Do I turn to mind-numbing entertainment? Do I turn to pornography? Do I turn to the bottle? There's a thousand places we can turn, right? And what if we saw how quickly we turn away for what Jesus calls it, faithlessness, twistedness, and yes, even idolatry. Now, these guys illustrate negatively perseverance. They don't. Now, before we go to the positive illustrations of this in our story, I just want a, a, a brief word about demon possession, okay? A friend of mine is actually preaching at Restore Church in Detroit, probably as I speak. Uh, shared some thoughts on how we think of demon possession today, and the short of it is, we don't. He said, quote, How would the demon-possessed man be helped today? Send him to a doctor and hope he gets the right meds? Maybe a padded cell? Maybe he just needs therapy and to address his childhood trauma. Or maybe he could be helped if people around him just knew his Enneagram numbers. Is every problem a demonic one? No, absolutely not. But are many of the manifestations of disease and problems actually because of the demonic? Yes, as well. My contention is that we spend a lot of effort throwing earthly solutions at cosmic problems rather than depending on prayer and fasting like everything dependent on it because it does. And even inside the church, Paul said many people were sick and dying because of not properly discerning the body and blood of Christ in, the, in, in, in communion. What's the moral of the story? In order to fight against evil, we better understand the nature of the battle, choose the appropriate weapons and means of employing them. So, just want to say, because uh, I've encountered demon-possessed people, and I'm sure you have as well, and, and even tried to cast out demons. So, See perseverance, though, two ways positively in the story. First, in the man, the, 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 father, the son's father. He could have turned away when the disciples were supposed to move the mountain, demon possession, they couldn't do it. He could have said, well, forget it, I'm done. But, but this, is, this is what the guy apparently thinks, what goes through his head. He says, if, if these guys who follow Jesus can't cast out the demon, well, maybe Jesus himself can. And he presses through a lot of friction to get to Jesus. Remember, they're arguing. The nine disciples and the scribes, the crowd is around him, and Jesus is there, and he just wades through the crowd to get to Jesus. He is an illustration of persevering. And he had a lot, I, I think you would agree with me on this. That man probably had a lot less light and instruction than the disciples, right? Right? who walked with Jesus how many years? Three years by the end of his ministry before he goes to the cross. A lot less light. You need to remember, and I need to remember, as I study for sermons and all the rest, theological knowledge, while good, does not equate to faith. You know that. And some of the simplest believers, therefore, have some of the deepest faith. This man illustrates that. Now, the other way we see perseverance positively modeled in this text is by the very words of what Jesus says to his disciples. His disciples, the ones that couldn't cast out the demon, finally, ultimately, at least have the humility to say, hey, Jesus, we weren't able to do it this time. We had before. Why not now? And Jesus gives us those famous words. 
When they say, verse 19, the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? He said to them, because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here and it will move. Now, my question for you is this. When Jesus says, if you had faith like mustard seed, what is he saying? What do you think? I thought for a long time, all Jesus is saying, you just need to have small faith, just a little bit, and that'll do it. Do you think it's that? I'm, you're like, I'm not getting set up. No, okay, but you, come on, you think that. Most of us have. But what I want to show you from the text is that can't be it. Because if that was it, then the solution would be the same thing as the problem. Let me show you this. I want to substitute little faith for, I'm going to substitute mustard seed faith with little faith. Let me read it this way. Verse 20, because he, he said to them, because of your little faith. Now, is he criticizing them or commending them right there? He's criticizing. This is the indictment against him, right? Yeah. They have little faith. That's the indictment. Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a little faith, you will say to this mountain. You see how that doesn't work? Yeah. Yeah. Like the very solution would be the problem. So what is this thing about mustard seed faith? Well, what we learn in the parable... Of the mustard seed is this is yes, it's very small. Yes, that part's true. But that little mustard seed becomes a massive plant, does it not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In other words, there is incredible growth in faith. And the point is here: persistence. Not moving away when your mountain is not moved in your timing. That is what grows your faith like nothing else. You are in God's gymnasium. Little faith, stagnant faith, actually looks like big faith when everything in your life is going good, right? Little faith that's not doing anything looks big when you got money in the bank, when your relationships are great, when your health is great, when your emotional state is great, when all is good, oh yeah, what great faith. But what really reveals the state of our faith is when we come up against a situation that's outside of our capacity to handle, i.e. a mountain. Four times in the Gospels, Jesus says to his disciples, oh, you of little faith. And he, he loves them, but he's not encouraging them right there. He's criticizing them. One time they're on a mount, they're they're in a boat, right? See a galley? And it looks like they're going to be, you know, boats going down. And they wild out and freak out and all the rest. He says, oh, you have little faith. Another time, because they're worried about what they're going to wear or what they're going to eat. Oh, you of little faith. Don't be anxious for anything. Another time, they got to feed 4,000 people, plus men and women, or plus women and children. And they forget that he just did that a little while ago with 5,000 men, plus women and children. He says, oh, you of little faith. Most of us should concede, I will concede for myself, that mountains show how how small my faith really is. And when you're in that spot, it is a beautiful, God-given opportunity to say, you know what, by God's grace, by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to persevere, I'm going to see my faith grow. I don't know what happened to a mountain, but my faith is going to grow. Or I can turn away. So this by far, by the way, was the longest point because I got 15 minutes, but I'm going to use every bit of those 15 minutes. So let's keep going. Okay. (laughs) Number two, really quickly, the second hallmark of mustard seed, Mount Moving Faith is this, is this faith doesn't pretend. Because you could think, well, now, because I'm not feeling so persevering, I got to kind of put on a paper mache face, a mask. He's not saying that. It, it, it doesn't pretend, rather it, it's, it's honest and it appeals to God for help. So again, if you went to Mark's account of this, the man comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now, that doesn't sound like great faith, does it? If you can, but you know what? Jesus will work with that honesty. He will. He doesn't push him away. Instead, he tries to draw it out more. He says, oh, okay, if you can, 
All things are possible, Jesus says to those who believe. And then the greatest prayer ever offered outside the prayers of Jesus himself, those memorable words. I can begin it and you can end it. Lord, I believe, but help my own belief. I love that. Can you see the point? He doesn't pretend, but he's asking God for help to believe. Instead of turning away, he does, he, he, he does persevere, doesn't he? But at the same time, he doesn't act like he's got it all together. Perfect, unwavering faith. He doesn't fake it. He, away with this trash, name it and claim it, arrogant. If I just believe it, it's automatically going to happen. Really? He doesn't have that cocksure arrogance, but he does have trust in the living Christ. And he offers, I say to you, the greatest prayer maybe ever prayed. Lord, I believe, but help my own belief. See, I love that because it acknowledges two things that we got to hold together. One is we are, we, we, we're obligated to believe. We ought to believe. And yet it also acknowledges that I need God's grace in order to do so. And as we see, well, Jesus moves on that kind of faith. He's going to remove the mountain and he's going to sustain this man's faith. Now, the third and final thing is this. We see what is mustard seed, mountain moving faith or the faith that God wants all his kids to have. What does it look like? It perseveres even when the mountain doesn't move. It keeps on pressing in. Number two, it doesn't pretend but asks for God for help. It appeals for grace. But third of all, and this is kind of already uh, understood, but I just want to make it plain, it prays. It literally prays. Someone has said, worry is simply praying to yourself. It's the sick art of praying to yourself. And we all do it, 3 a.m. in the morning, 3.07, and you just wake up, and who who here has been like that? I've had some big decisions to make recently, and I've woken up from like four to six. I'm just thinking about this thing. I'm like, okay, stop thinking about it just to myself and take it to the Lord. And the man could have internalized, right? He could have practiced the sick art of praying to himself. He could have said, man, if the disciples can't do it, ain't nothing can be done. And he could have just kind of started chasing his tail like we all do, right? Spinning around and around, digging himself into a hole of depression. He could have joined the arguing and the commotion and the bickering at the foot of the mountain. He could have done all that. But rather, as we saw, he, 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 it's, a, it's a kind of a prayer, isn't it? He's, he sees Jesus face to face, but it is a prayer. Lord, I believe, but help my own belief. And in our text, he says this great word, this great wonderful Christian word, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have undeserved favor. And in Mark, even more to the point, when in, when Jesus responds to um, the, the disciples saying, why couldn't we cast the demon out? Jesus says these words. You know these words. This kind, Jesus says, cannot come out except by what? Prayer and fasting. That's what he says. This kind cannot come out except by prayer and fasting. Jesus explicitly says that only can happen, it can only be driven out by prayer. You see, mustard seed, mountain-moving faith, or the faith that Jesus expects us all to have, is faith that expresses its trust in God through active prayer. Now, formal prayer is great. Corporate prayer is great. I mean, I think that's really big. Prepared prayer, but, you know, using prayer acronyms, acts, you know, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, those are all great frameworks. But I don't think he's talking about that here. Rather, what we're talking about isn't sexy, it isn't fancy, it doesn't follow any prayer acronym. It just consists of sighs and sometimes complaints and hopes and dreams and, and Lord, you got to help me, I can't do this. That this sometimes is just a silent conversation between you and God that says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, I can't do this. Please step into this situation. And we come to Jesus for prayer again and again and again. And so I just say to you, mustard seed, mountain moving faith, faith that Jesus wants us all to have, it perseveres. Even when the mountain ain't moved, you still press into God. But it's honest. It doesn't pretend. It asks for help. And third of all, yeah, it prays. Now, I think this is pretty healthy biblical instruction. 
But if I finished here, I would massively miss the mark. Because to be honest with you, there's times I need more than instruction. I need something more. In fact, I need someone more. Because at the end of the day, it's not us that sustains our faith in Christ. It's Christ who sustains our faith in Him. And that's really good news because I'm just going to be honest with you. You know this. There are some dark nights of the soul. There are some dark seasons you will go through in your faith. There are times when you are an absolute mess. There are times when your job is a mess. There's a time when your marriage is a mess. There's a time when you're Kids are a mess, or your finances are a mess. The reality is we are going to be in some messes sometimes, right? And while that man that I referred to several times, the, the, father's, the son's father, is a great example, let's be clear, Jesus is the hero of this story. And in fact, the whole story, in a way, pictures what Jesus came to do. Now stay with me. He comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration where he is glorified. And he comes down into this hot mess. But what does he do? He fixes it. The demon-possessed man is delivered. And even if it's one small click, the disciples' faith is grown. Well, doesn't that remind us how Jesus came down from glory? Who, being in the form of God... Thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Why did he do that? He did that to fix the ultimate mess. Our alienation from God. God is holy. We are sinful. We can't unsinfulness ourselves. We need redemption. We need grace. We need forgiveness. And even as a Christian, as I just said, we can sometimes can be an absolute mess, can't we? I mean, even the disciples right here, Jesus is telling them week after week, day after day, month after month, and following it, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to the cross. They ain't even getting it yet. Look at the last two words that Arpith, or last two verses Arpith read. They were gathering in Galilee. Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly rejoicing. No, what does it say? They're greatly, it's still not clicking for them. And yet, he will bring them home safely, every one of them. He will bring them home. Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim has showed this one scene where there's a flame. And there's a guy pouring water on that flame. And he asks, I think it's interpreter, if, I, if I'm recalling right. He asks interpreter, how come this flame is not going out when all the water's going on it? Do you remember what the answer is? There's one that is pouring oil on it. That's Jesus Christ sustaining his faith. Faithful who is he who has begun a good work in you. He will perform it through the day of Jesus Christ. I so identified with Peter. Do you identify with Peter? You ever have super high mountaintop moments with the Lord and then 24 hours later you're in the valley of the shadow of death? Peter. Hey, some of you are going to deny me, Jesus says. Peter. <laughs> Those punks, yeah. I will never, never, he's quite vehement about this, I will never deny you. Uh-uh. Those punks, yeah, they'll probably skate on you. Not me, not me. No, Peter, before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. No, 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 no. Not those chumps, yeah. Servant girl to him while Jesus is up before Pilate. You were with Jesus, weren't you? First tactic he has is he, he feigns ignorance. I don't know who you're talking about. Another gal. Yeah, I, you, you were with him. No, I was not. And then this other guy comes in and says, hey, you have a Galilean accent. Didn't you follow the Galilean? He, he, I don't know how to interpret this, but he, the Bible says he swears an oath and a vow. I never have seen that man. 
And then the cock crowed. You've had any cock crowing moments in your life? Have you? I go fishing. I'm just going back to what I used to do. And then the Lord comes to me and says, Peter, peace be with you. 2 Timothy 1.12 says, while, what is it? Um, Even when we are faithless, he is faithful. Yeah. Now, if someone confesses Christ and never turns back, it shows they never were truly born again. But for those who are in Christ, it's not just the perseverance of the saints, it's the perseverance of the Savior. Amen. This is what he said. This is what he said. No one can pluck you out of his hand if you're in Christ. He said, in, he prayed in John 17, Father, of all that you've given me, I have lost none except the son of perdition, and that was predestined from the foundation of the world. Check this out. I'm, I'm, I'm about to close it, okay? Check this out. In Romans 8, 34, there's this great boast, like nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 34, he is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. It says in Hebrews, he ever lives to make intercession for you. He's pouring oil. He's doing that. If you had supersonic ears, you could hear the Son of God who purchased you on Calvary's tree interceding you so that he will not lose one who has truly come to him by the Father's grace. And remember what he said to Peter? Hey, Peter, Simon, 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 Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you. So that when you turn back, you will strengthen your brothers. So you strengthen your brothers and sisters when they got mountains that are causing them to turn back, okay? Do that for them. And Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says that you can be confident in this very good thing that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it all the way to the day of Jesus Christ. So when your faith is so feeble, you can't cry out to the Lord, you can at least collapse at his feet. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Praise be to God. Father, thank you.